Good morning. I want to welcome you all to the First Presbyterian Church of New Vernon. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you are with us here today. There's a lot happening in the church, and I encourage you to look at the upcoming events in your bulletin and also to subscribe to our email newsletter so you can read about them and register for them. Uh, this week, we are having our Let's Do Lunch program on Wednesday, and we look forward to welcoming uh, Sam Lanasa from More Perfect Union to help facilitate some discussion for us during that event. It should be a lot of fun. You can email Faith Winnow to sign up for that, or you can just come. Uh, it's better if we know how many people to expect, so please uh, let Faith, raise your hand, Faith, so people see you. Uh, know either by email or by speaking to her during coffee hour for that. We have a number of other programs coming up uh, from our Eras Tour movie to uh, an Earth Day celebration next Sunday. Uh, are there any other announcements at this time? The only uh, detail I will add about our worship this morning, unfortunately one of our kids is sick, so Haley is home with them. There will be no Sunday school for kids in fourth grade and up. Uh, you're welcome to either stay in worship or you can head over to the nursery uh, and join Tess there. Either one is okay. We're now going to prepare our hearts and minds for worship by listening to the introit that the choir has prepared. Please stand and join, me, and join me in the call to worship. To see the life, the teams around us, to give thanks for the gift we have received, to notice the beauty and promise of spring, to breathe deeply of the season, to accept the gift of love and to love in return. This is to worship God. Let us uh, continue standing and join our voices together with him 231.
the call to confession. Before we call, God answers us. While we are still speaking, God hears us. Let us confess our sins to God, who even now is waiting to say, I forgive you. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Generous God, in Jesus you have shown us love, love that seeks, love that suffers, love that survives all things. You call us, even command us, to show that love is in our lives. Yet we turn away from what you would have us do. We confess that the ways of love are not our ways. We deny and ignore, hurt and hate, despise and reject. Have mercy on us. Help us to receive your love so that we can love others. Help us to receive your love so that we can love ourselves. The assurance of pardon. God calls to us from wherever we are. God's love shines like a beacon. God's voice echoes in our souls. You are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share with one another a sign of God's peace. As we return to our seats, I'd like to invite the kids to join me up front for a minute. Emily, does your baby have a name? No, she's very sweet. I'm glad you're taking care of her. How's everybody doing this morning? Some of us look a little bit sleepy this morning. Mr. Will, how are you doing, bud? You want to come here? Are you wearing a master's vest? That is very sharp. Have you been watching that at home with dad and mom? No? No TV? I watch, I watch, I watch Uh-huh. Bluey's more fun than golf sometimes, right? We've, you've got Bluey here, Abby, don't you? Yeah. You've got a Bluey too. Does anybody have news they want to share with us? Lila, yeah. Um, I in you skated in a competition, and did you place in that? Uh, second. second place. Congratulations. That is really well done. <laughs> Arabella, you've got some news? I, I watched <laughs> yeah. yeah? That sounds fun. And Molly? Uh, you've got a track meet? Yes. Uh huh. Mm hmm. 
That is a busy day. Birthday party, track meet, and thank you for coming here on a busy day. I, that's a lot. Tell me. Mm-hmm. Baseball season starting. Was Cash there too? I know he had baseball pictures yesterday, but he might be on a different team. We have another Bright Spots video to show you guys. People have been sending in Bright Spots since Easter. Uh, we have some spring break pictures, and I thought we could all watch those together. Uh, Tony's going to play that video for us now. What do you think? <laughs> Is it good? Saturn on. I think the music's really soft. We can turn it up, maybe.
So it was really cool to see some of you guys in those pictures. And if you have more bright spots, be sure to send them in so we can put them in our next video. Now, in Sunday school today, you guys are going to hear a story about two disciples named Peter and John healing somebody. And I wondered if you could help me act out that story. Can we do that? You're a little sleepy this morning, so if not, I can make the choir do it. <laughs> so we have a narrator. Does anybody want to be our narrator? Zoe, you want to do that? And John? You want to be John, Will? No? Okay. Augie, why don't you be John? No? Okay. Um, Theron, can you be John for us? Okay. And uh, man? Tommy will be the man. Here you go. And thank you, Theron. And we need a Peter. June, can you be Peter for me? No? Okay. Rachel will be Peter, thank you. And I think that's everything. We narrator John Mann. Okay, perfect. Now the man, here you go, uh, cannot walk, Tommy. So you have to be sitting down. Here you go. And you have not been able to walk since you were born, actually. Uh, and so Peter and John are going to be over here because uh, they are walking to the temple to pray. And man, you are sitting at the door to the temple, which is right here. And then Zoe, our narrator, you can go behind the microphone here. Okay, perfect. And I, let's see how it goes. One day, a while after Easter, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. Let's go to the temple to pray. On the way in, in they meet a, ba a, man, a man begging for money. Can you please help me? This man had never been able to walk and depended on the help of other people to survive. His friends would carry him from his house to the temple every day. Other people would give him money so he could buy food and other things he needed. Then more of his friends would come at the end of every day to carry him back home. That's a lot of help. Peter and John saw the man sitting by the entrance to the temple and got his attention. Okay, so man, you're going to turn around. Peter and John have your attention. <clears throat> this way. There you go. I don't have any money to give you, but I can give you something else. The man wasn't quite sure what to expect, but he looked at Peter and John waiting to see what would happen. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And just like that, the man <laughs> got up and walked. And he didn't just walk. He started jumping and praising God all the way into the temple. <laughs> Perfect. Every, and everyone saw him was amazed. Thank you. Let's give our <laughs> actors a round of applause for that. <laughs> Zoe, that was really well read. Thank you. And, and thank you, Rachel and Theron, for helping out, too. Now, what did you guys think of this story? We are sleepy. It was funny. It was a little funny. Yeah, that is true. A lot funny. There is a lot going on in that story. But one thing I noticed about it is this man. Uh, who helped that man in this story? That's right. Everybody, everybody helped the man. So usually when we hear this story, uh, when the grown-ups talk about it, they focus on Peter and John healing the man, on him getting better, uh, and being able to go in the temple and pray. But something I noticed is that even before Peter and John showed up, there were lots of other people helping him too. There were the people that brought him to the temple every day to pray. There were the people that gave him money because he couldn't work so he could buy food with that. And then there were other people who came back at the end of the day and brought him home. The whole community came together to help him out. And I can't think of a better picture for the church and our church family than that, than us helping each other and all coming together as a community where every single person here can help out. Just like when you guys didn't want to read, 
Rachel and Theron stepped in to do that for us. There are lots of big and little ways where every single one of us, including every single one of you, can help other people. And I am sure you're going to talk about that in your Sunday school classes with Miss Emma and Miss Garo. You're going to head over to Sunday school now. So can we leave a blessing here before you go? One, two, three. And may God be with you there. Now, big kids, I know that uh, you are staying here, and I was going to ask you if you wanted to read uh, the Bible verse or something else or prayers, but I think we'll maybe pass on that this morning. Thank you. Please join me for the prayer of illumination found in your bulletin. Listen for God's word coming to us in scripture. Our hearts and minds are open. May God be in our listening and in our understanding. Amen. The first scripture lesson this morning is taken from Psalm chapter 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust into the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the next few weeks in the New Testament, we will be working our way through the book of Acts and reading about the early church and what they were doing in the aftermath of Easter. This morning, we're reading from chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And the man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him is the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is number 800, Sometimes a Light Surprises.
Tommy, how did the Bible verse compare to the play, do you think, that we just read? Play version was better. I think maybe I agree. We are obsessed with trying to predict the future. And there's a book called Future Babel that studies about 20 years worth of predictions from experts on what would happen in the future. And do you know what they found is that these experts were a little better and sometimes considerably worse than what they called a dart-throwing chimpanzee <laughs> at trying to tell us what the future will look like. Uh, some of my favorite examples were in 1914, a British journalist named H.N. Norman who proclaimed that there would be no more wars among the six great nations of the world. In 1968, the president of the Anaconda Copper Mine predicted his company would be successful for the next 500 years. Do you know what happened 10 years later? Fiber optics came and Anaconda was out of business. In 1968, Paul Ehrlich predicted the overpopulation of the world would uh, create a total collapse in the world's food supply. Obviously, has not happened. In uh, 1990, the MIT economist Lester Thurlow declared Japan was the betting favorite to win economic honors of owning the 21st century. Uh, and closer to home, Goldman Sachs in 2008 predicted oil was going to surge to $200 a barrel within six months. Do you know what happened with that? It fell to $34 a barrel. Why do we keep listening to these experts trying to predict the future, even when time and time again they are proven wrong. The author of this book says that there is something about us that demands to have some certainty and security about what the future holds. We cannot fight that impulse. We see the disciples struggling with that in the aftermath of Easter as well. They have no idea what the future holds for them. And after Jesus rises from the dead and they meet him, they all camp out in Jerusalem trying to figure out what is next. And the stories we read today and for the coming weeks tell the story of how they figured that out. At this point in the story, in chapter 2, they have met the risen Jesus but it's still too confusing and overwhelming, too much for them to completely process because they've never seen or experienced anything like that before. None of us have. And they don't have language to describe it or anything else to compare it with. Two of them met Jesus walking on their way to Emmaus. Doubting Thomas met Jesus in a locked room. Some other disciples met Jesus on the beach. And in each instance, the words used to describe them are fearful, stunned, amazed, and confused. Nobody was convicted and certain. One interesting thing, if you look at all of these encounters together, is that all of them go out of their way to emphasize that Jesus was raised from the dead, not just spiritually, but physically as well. All of them want us to be sure that we know Jesus was alive, not just in spirit, but in body as well. In one story, the disciples are afraid that they're seeing a ghost or a spirit, and so Jesus sits down and eats a meal of grilled fish with them, because ghosts cannot eat. We all know the story of doubting Thomas, who declared he would not believe unless he saw Jesus with his own eyes and touched his wounds with his hands. The disciples walking to Emmaus similarly sat down and ate a meal with Jesus. All of them is see not just a ghost or an apparition or a dream, but a living and breathing human being. Now you could write a doctoral dissertation on what that means for our faith or speculating on where the physical body of Jesus is today in space and time. And some people have done both of those things. The big takeaway for me from this is that salvation is not just spiritual. Salvation is holistic and it includes all of us. Now we don't talk about salvation a lot in the Presbyterian church. 
Not once in my 41 years have I walked into a Presbyterian church and been asked, are you saved? We are not known for our dramatic baptisms or our altar calls because that feels a little off brand for us. And that's fair for a denomination whose nickname is the Frozen Chosen. But we tend to leave that to the Pentecostals and the Baptists. They take care of it for us while we worry about things like predestination. But maybe we shouldn't. Regardless of how uncomfortable that question, are you saved, might make us, salvation is a core doctrine of our faith. You can't be a Christian without it. And so we have to have something to say about it. Now, salvation is clearly a loaded term. It comes with a lot of baggage, and it has many different meanings or understandings to different people. At its most basic level, salvation is being rescued or saved from something, usually from death. And in the church, we talk about salvation as something God offers us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. When we drive down to Tennessee to visit my wife's family, one sign that we are clearly south of the Mason-Dixon line is that we see all these billboards along the side of the road asking, are you saved? And they usually have some kind of scary graphic on them, like flames or a big lake of fire. And what those billboards mean, what the question they're really asking is, when you die, are you going to be in heaven or in hell? As a question, that makes us uncomfortable. The cool kids call it cringy, but it highlights an assumption that people make about salvation. And that assumption is that the rescue on offer, the saving being done, is from hell. Salvation from death equals rescue from hell. And the salvation on offer is a place in heaven. And when do both of those things happen? After you die. So salvation is about af what happens after physical death. Another assumption that it makes is that salvation's primary importance is individual. Am I saved? Are you saved? Is my soul going to heaven when I die? That's the question we tend to ask. Well, not Presbyterians, at least not out loud. But when we look at the Easter stories and when we read what the first Christians were saying about these Easter stories, we see them focusing on something else. Jesus' appearance and his affirmation that his resurrected or saved body was real, something they could see and touch for themselves, suggests that salvation isn't just a spiritual event. Jesus' ministry and his disciples' ministry after he left them don't focus on rescuing people from something after they die. They don't talk about eternal torment or darkness all the time. They focus on healing and helping people here and now, on this side of eternity. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus going out of his way to do things that affirm life and encourage it to flourish. He heals people who are sick. He works to include people who have been shunned by their communities, and he feeds people who are hungry. Likewise, he works to overcome and speak out against things that stifle life and growth. He speaks out against religious hypocrisy and legalism, and he confronts intolerism and indifference. This is salvation. This is the rescue God is offering us, not just an affirmation of life after death, but also a strong affirmation of life here and now. And that's exactly what we see in this story with Peter and John as they head to the temple to pray. They encounter a man begging for money. And even in its introduction, as we talked about with the kids, this story isn't just about one man. It's a story about a community. 
It includes the people who care for him, carrying him to the temple every morning, giving him money to buy food throughout the day, and then more people coming back at the end of the day to bring him home. The miracle Peter performs in that story has an effect not just on the man himself, but on the entire community. Everybody there is changed by what happens. And Peter and John, when they meet him, they don't tell the man, keep your chin up, things are gonna get better someday. What they do is make a difference right then and there. His salvation is in the present. His salvation is communal and his salvation is organic. It's about encountering God and living fully right where we are now. And it's not a one-on-one affair between you and God, where you assent to one or two beliefs and then you get a reserved seat on the bus to heaven. When we talk about salvation here, I and me become us and we. And salvation is organic, literally, because it includes all living things, even the world around us. And from this perspective, we can see the raw material of God's kingdom for the salvation of the world everywhere we look. Since the beginning of time, God has been at work in the world. The law of Moses and the Psalms all bear witness to this. And in Easter, and in the aftermath of Easter, as they meet the risen Christ, the disciples get a glimpse of this new creation God is working on. And in Jesus, God challenges them to spread the word and to communicate to other people what they have seen and experienced. And they do this not just with their words, but with their actions as well. They show other people what's ultimately beyond the reach of any language. They show people what new life in God really looks like. And that creates a chain reaction as more and more people are filled with what Luke calls wonder and amazement. They're empowered to share and see what they've seen and experienced. Today, that task is ours. We inherit that witness of the disciples and the witness of the many generations who've come before us. We also inherit the challenge to discover and share what salvation God is offering us today remembering that God does not work to establish the kingdom in some far off corner of the universe. God's kingdom is here and we are its ambassadors. When we look to the future, there are so many things in life that are uncertain. Our jobs, our health, our children, None of us knows where we will be in five years' time. The good news of Easter is that God meets us in the midst of those uncertainties, bringing the promise of salvation, not in some distant future, but here and now. This is our hope, hope to do things we didn't think we could, Hope to find happiness and purpose in unexpected places. Hope to find a way forward in situations that we thought were impossible. Hope in life beginning yet again. Our challenge and our blessing is to share that hope. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please be seated. Will you join me in affirming our faith using the words printed in the bulletin? We believe that God is present in the darkness before dawn, in the waiting and uncertainty, where fear and courage join hands, conflict and caring link arms, and the sun rises over barbed wire. We believe in a with us God, who sits down in our midst to share our humanity. We affirm our faith that takes us beyond the safe place, into action, into vulnerability, and into the streets. We commit ourselves to work for change and put ourselves on the line <clears throat> to bear responsibility, take risks, live powerfully, and face humiliation, to stand with those on the edge, to choose life and be used by the Spirit for God's new community of hope. Amen. And let us now go to God in prayer. God of abundant grace, we gather today just as your first disciples gathered in the wake of the resurrection, in joy, wonder, and disbelief. We remember that whenever we gather in your name, you appear in our midst, offering us the comfort of your presence and the assurance of your love. And we give you thanks that like those first disciples, you gave us a community to practice our faith. Grant us grace to hold space for one another's doubts and questions. Give us courage to admit that we do not have all the answers. Make this community where we explore what it means to receive your forgiveness and dedicate our lives to you. We remember that when the risen Christ first appeared to his disciples, he offered them peace. And we know our world is deeply in need of your peace, O oh God. A peace that is not only the absence of conflict, but the presence of wholeness for all people. We pray for innocent victims of war, especially those in Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and around the world. Put an end to violence, Lord. Teach us to recognize our shared humanity, our shared status as your beloved children, each created in your image. Lead each of us to prioritize peace, both in our homes, our communities, and in the wider world. As we pray for this, we pray also for all who sit in seats of power, asking that you fill their hearts with compassion and their decisions with wisdom, that all people might have the chance not only to survive, but to flourish. Holy God, we pray that you save us from despair, that you would open our eyes to see signs of resurrection and life all around us. Plant hope within us and help us to nurture its tender shoots that it might grow more robust each day. May we begin to imagine the future of your new creation, your salvation today. Loving God, on this morning, we pray for members of our community who need your care. Ease the suffering of the sick and speed the healing of those in recovery. Comfort those who mourn and bring to rest all who are worn down. Surround the isolated with love and soothe those troubled minds which are anxious. We offer you the names of those we know and love in need of prayer this morning now in the silence of our hearts. Lord of life, remind us of our call to love one another as you have loved us, with a love that casts out fear and creates community. 
Grant us energy to serve one another with humility and hope. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ come again, comes again, and all things are made new. We pray all of these things, and we pray with the words your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Go My Children with My Blessing. Uh, and one thing I love about this, you might recognize the melody of the song, is it's actually a Christmas carol tune uh, from Wales. And so it always reminds us, even in the season of Easter, that all of the things we do here are connected, that we can't celebrate Easter without looking back to Christmas. Uh, and we give thanks that God holds all of those things together because we so often have a hard time holding even what's on our plate. Please stand. Go out into the world in peace and be of good courage, returning no person evil for evil, but support the weak, help the afflicted, and rejoice in God's presence as God is with you always. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of the earth be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.